Okay, so today I'm going to go through uh, lenses effects and uh, sort of photographic and uh, yeah, photographic effects that sort of come together to make CG look uh, not CG and make it look photo real or at least aid in that process. And so yeah, I'll show you a quick example of why this is something I spent a lot of time on. When I was making uh, wings, I had a lot of uh, renders to put together to make look a lot more photo real or photographic and I created a gizmo that could sort of procedurally lens the entire film so this is the before of what renders would look like and this is the after and you can see we've got depth stuff going in lens flaring and lots and lots of things like this um, and there's a write-up in on my website where I go through uh, the tool yeah, so if you want to look more into that, go have a look, and I'll talk you through it. So the first step when you're doing stuff like this is to think about uh, the physical camera or the physical world. And so here's my uh, amazing... What frame did I do it on? Frame 1. Brilliant. Here's my amazing doodle. So let me explain what's going on here. We've got here, we've got our uh, geometry in the scene and then we've got uh, our lens like the physical glass then we have the aperture and we have the sensor and we've got the wall at the back and so when we're doing stuff I'm gonna uh, flip back to this and explain what part of the process from the photon bouncing off a light source onto the object all the way through to the sensor I'm talking about so first things first we've got our scene here which is just before we've hit the glass, before anything has happened. Then uh, we do uh, something called depth haze, where you see this is quite often in um, landscape photography, you see this a lot, where as light sort of bounces around in the, uh, in the air molecules or smoke or particles in the, or smog or anything like that, um, you get this misting effect. And so what's happening in here is, um, air will naturally bounce blue light more than everything else so you get sort of blue lifting effect so if I show you that here what I'm doing is I'm taking the depth information from the scene and then turning it into a gradient and the way I'm doing this is I'm color picking where I want my black point to be I'm holding control and alt to color pick before the node so to color pick these values and I can set how far back I want my smog to go and if I do that in real time you see I can push it so that the smog is only at the back or here. Likewise with the white point I can do the same thing. I can pull it forward or I can push it back and if we look at the output that's the same as doing something like this. And uh, yep yeah, I've got this plugged into an ad and what this is doing is it's lifting those values and on your grade node you've actually got a lift but um, I prefer to use an ad because it will lift the whole of your color curve equally whereas when you use a lift, what can happen and can cause you some problems is uh, a lift is the exact same process as lifting this point on a curve except if you look, when you look lift this point, it's actually lowering all the values beyond 1 and um, that can get kind of dangerous because, I could prove myself totally wrong here but I think this will happen this has a value of 200 when I lift it, those values are actually getting pulled down which we don't want Whereas uh, if we do an add, the effect is almost identical, but those values are getting brighter, which is what you'd expect. Uh, great. Uh, next up on our little diagram here, the photon has come through the atmosphere. Uh, so if it hits the back and comes through the atmosphere, it's going to get bluer along the way. Or as it comes here, it's going to be less blue than coming from over here. So now we're going to hit the glass, and inside the glass, you get defocusing, which is where you get this kind of thing. And so this happens as a combination of the glass and the aperture. And so when we do our defocus, which is this, and this is just a standard set defocus, uh, nothing crazy going on here. Um, if I turn this up a lot, you see we get something like this. And um, if I set this to be bladed, it might not show up this much on this, but uh, if I set it to be bladed, that's the same as setting the number of um, uh, 
blades on your aperture. And so when you see defocus, it's got sort of hard edges. Like um, on here, I think you can kind of see it, but it's maybe not the best example. Sometimes you'll see octagonal or pentagonal, pentagonal um, bokeh shapes. And that's because you have a five-sided or eight-sided um, eight-sided aperture. So if I really quickly just uh, make some crunchy noise, everyone loves a bit of crunchy noise, and use that to, um, oops, there we go, and use that to make this a lot brighter. Yep, let's set this to something and say about 50. I'm going to crunch this down even more, just so we've got some really things. You should, there we go, you can see the five-sided um, shapes. And so if I change this to like eight, for example, same thing, eight-sided aperture. And then uh, when you set it to disk, it's the same as having a perfectly, um, perfectly circular uh, aperture. And what will happen in uh, industry quite a lot, well, almost all the time, is this thing called bokeh kernels. And what this does is, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, there's a lot of sweet corn in this, but um, we don't use sweet corn much for defocus. Um, yeah, you see this, we get information like this and we plug those into the filter of our thingy. Let me quickly, uh, let me quickly pull this in, one moment. So when we pull this in, you can plug this into the filter of your uh, Z defocus and tell it to use image and tell it to use all channels. And what will happen is you'll get these nice blue edges because we had blue edges on our bokeh kernel. It's quite subtle, but you can just see it. If I change it to disk, yeah, see? Um, yeah, so that's that. That's defocus. And next up on our diagram, we've got our aperture. And then we have this thing called chromatic average. Uh, no, we don't. We have lens distortion because lens distortion happens in the glass. Uh, cool. So whether you do your lens distortion or defocus in different orders and stuff um, is up to you. Do whatever works best for the situation. And that's true for a lot of these, actually. Um, so lens distortion, what people do is they get these lens grids and you ask the computer to crunch the numbers on it and you get, uh, you figure out how distorted your image is. And so I've just quickly used a lens distortion node and I've literally just put random values in here. And that's distorting it. But um, if you're doing this properly, you would use actual lens distortion information. Hello, this is um, Hugo's desk. Actually, watch his video on this. It's um, you just have to be better at shooting lens grids. I think is what the video is called. Um, in general, I think definitely go watch Hugo's videos. He's a really nice guy, and his stuff is really good. Um, turn this on and off. Awesome. Um, yeah. And so what this is happening is, as all the glass is being refracted. Um, you get uh, you get a warped image, and refraction is when light moves at different speeds depending on what medium it's inside of or what material it's passing through. Um, cool. And then again, all of these because they all happen in the glass. Kind of, I tend to do them in the order that works best for the shot. Um, but maybe there's a proper way that I don't know. But to my knowledge, um, I tend to mix and match these depending on whether whatever layer is best or because sometimes when you're layering things different ways um, if you did lens distortion first and then you did chrome app or something maybe your alpha channel wouldn't transfer properly and things like that so yeah next up is uh, bloom bloom is basically what happens when light doesn't perfectly refract through the glass and it will bounce around inside this glass internally quite a lot and bounce between all of this and just come out as this crazy bloom thing and it does this thing called um, quadratic fall off, where every time you, I want to say every time you double the distance, it is one quarter as powerful. And the way you do that is uh, you can get your blurs and link them so that each blur is double the previous one. And so what I've done is I actually make a blur and then uh, link the value across like this, edit the expression, and put times two. 
and then the next one you make uh, double the previous one and the pre uh, double the previous one and the previous one and the same here I'm averaging these each time but each time the average is half the last one and so at the end you get this lovely bloomed thing that you can plus over the top and there's your bloom so already if we do a one between the two we're getting a much more photographic look on our image uh, games use bloom quite a lot because it's a very accessible way to uh, make something that looks really great and really photographic and it sort of immediately sort of fills the vacuum like here it feels very you know if I turn off the atmosphere uh, it feels like we're in a massive vacuum and then when we come down to the bloom it starts to answer that question for us uh, next up you have this thing called transverse aberration and that is what happens when your red green and blue light get um, split as they come through the glass and then they hit different point, uh, points on the sensor on the same plane as the sensor, like this. Um, and so the way I've done that here is I've literally just shuffled the red out, shuffled the, uh, shuffled the green out, shuffled the blue out, and then um, I've just done a scale offset and added them all together. Now this is a really quick and dirty way of doing it. If you were going to do this properly, you would um, take your lens distortion and do this all together in one go. So it probably makes more sense for um, probably makes more sense for these to come before the bloom. Um, you would take your lens distortion and you would lens distort each channel a slightly different amount. But um, I've shown both ways here because sometimes you just need to get those like one or two pixels on the edge, and this is a really quick and dirty way of doing it. Uh, next up we have this thing called axial aberration, or I think it's called longitudinal aberration. And that's where the points D, uh, come to focus at different planes of, uh, away from your sensor. So here, for example, red is focusing behind the sensor and blue is focusing in front of the sensor, which means that green would be the only channel that was um, correctly focused. And you will see this quite a lot. Um, where you get like a purple, um, this sort of purple looking defocus almost. Well, it is a defocus. Um, I know when we were shooting Wild Roots, this was something that came up a lot, is that we had a lot of purple edging. And that's um, exactly because of this here. Uh, next up, we have something called halation. And this is um, the same principle as Bloom, but instead of happening inside the glass, it happens inside the physical film that you're shooting on. So imagine your light has um, gone inside your film instead of a digital sensor, and it's just bouncing around on the inside of this, the same way it was bouncing around on the inside of um, the glass. And uh, the way you do that uh, is the exact same, or at least the way I do it is the exact same as um, Bloom. But I will tint it slightly purple. Um, because, or again, it depends on what you're doing. If you're shooting on a film that's a lot more blue or a lot more orange, uh, use those values instead. Like here, it's a very orange halation. And so the way I do that is I would just spin this thing around to be more sort of saturated orange. And then if I turn this bad boy up, yeah, you start to get that real like, this is like your sapia film kind of thing. Uh, if you were making like an Instagram filter, we got it mate, job done. Um, by the way, the way I'm getting these values here on my nodes is here I'm doing, uh, this is a TCL expression, and so I'm just doing value mix, and what this is doing is it's returning the value of the mix slider. And then right at the end, you do your like grain and your nodes, like this, and there you are, this is a lot more photographic. I've turned everything up to 11 here, this is way too much. Or maybe it wouldn't be way too much if you had some insane shooting conditions. But uh, yeah, if you look at that immediately, it's just such a different, um, such a more um, photographic look. And uh, yeah, if you do this, <laughs> you can see I've been watching a lot of Phineas and Ferb. Um, if you do this to taste, then you get um, you get a pretty good looking. Uh, pretty good looking result. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. Uh, any questions, contact me anywhere you know how. YouTube comments, 3dhit.com.
godt kan lide, kan I uh, mig længe til mig, hvad er min nummer, Facebook, I don't mind. Ja, um, yeah. thanks.